All right, so I do believe that we are live. I do believe that we are live now. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us, both our audience and then these fantastic panelists here. Uh, before we went live, I was just telling them that I really appreciate them coming on because this decision was just made and who knows what, it, you know, the news cycle changes so quickly, who knows what will come next. So I wanna go ahead and start by introducing my co-host from the podcast, Red, Blue and Brady. Although I probably should introduce myself. I'm JJ Jamplone. I'm the host of Red Room Brady. And this is my fabulous co-host, Kelly Sampson, who is legal counsel at Brady and the head of racial justice initiatives. Hi, everyone. Um, and I have the pleasure of sending the proverbial mic over to our panelists now if they have an opportunity to introduce themselves. And I want to start with John. If you could just introduce yourself. Sure, my name is John Lowy. I'm Vice President of Legal and Chief Counsel at Brady. And then uh, Aryan, you could introduce yourself. Hey everyone, my name is Aryan. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a youth advocate in Fairfax County, Virginia and the chapter lead for Team Now Fairfax. And then Chris Brown. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Brown and I'm the president of Brady. And finally, Dr. Griffin Dix. Uh, Griffin Dix with the Oakland Brady chapter um, and co-chair of the chapter, Oakland, California. And it's very exciting that we have, it's weird, it's very rare now anymore that we have an all Brady panel, <laughs> but it's very exciting to see the mix between people who work at Brady directly, the people who, well, person who runs Brady Chris, and then some of our fantastic Team Enough members and chapter members. So it's just, it's really great to have all of you here. And I want to start by turning to John Lowy, affectionately normally called Lowy, by those in the know. If you could explain to our listeners, you know, why, why we're here, why, what is PLACA or the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act? You know, what is it? Why does it matter? Can you give us a, a law school version of Schoolhouse Rock? Sure. Uh, well, PLACA is a federal law that um, when George W. Bush was president, it was the NRA's number one uh, agenda item. They, they could have picked anything they wanted uh, to protect the gun industry, and what they picked was, was PLACA. And what it does is it gives the gun industry unique protection from civil liability. So basic uh, negligence law, which is a, requires all of us to use reasonable care in what we do. Um, it applies to all of us. We can all be liable if we're negligent, except if you're a gun company. Uh, in many cases, you can get special protection that, again, no person or industry in America has. So it's, it's quite outrageous, and it was enacted in 2005, and it remains law, and it prevents gun companies from being held liable in many cases, not all cases, we get around it some, but there are some exceptions, but uh, a lot of cases. Well, and I think that that sets up brilliantly why we've all gathered here today for this webinar, which is specifically to discuss, you know, the title of this, a major victory plaque found unconstitutional, something that just happened in the news, um, a very recent plaque decision. And, and Chris, I'm wondering if you could articulate to our audience, you know, what happened in that recent decision? Well, uh, I think John is in a better position to articulate what happened in that decision because we've been looking at various uh, efforts in the litigation realm since PLACA was passed. You know, ostensibly when you talk to the yeah, members of the NRA, uh, uh, people like Wayne LaPierre, what they'll say is PLACA was necessary to protect the gun industry from litigation that would have completely uh, bankrupted the gun industry. Uh, that's not true. Um, it's uh, one of the only product immunity or product liability immunity laws that ostensibly purported by Congress to provide very broad immunity to the gun industry. There is no other industry in American life today that has a law that attempts to shield it from liability 
for basic kinds of issues related to their products. And the case that John will talk about in just a second, uh, I think the important thing, because John is not someone, as we know, Loewy very well, who's going to toot his own horn, but um, when you're looking at litigation and you're looking mm -hmm. at a law like PLACA, that's attempting to prov provide such broad immunity to the industry, you mm -hmm. have to think about what kind of case you're going to bring and how you can really uh, attack the underpinnings of that case to really demonstrate to courts the negative impact on public policy and American life and basic justice that's rendered as a result of the law. And it took a long time to figure out what kind of case to bring forward. Ultimately, the Gustafson case is that case. And uh, obviously we know <laughs> that the Pennsylvania court got it right, but I'll leave it to John to give the particulars and details of how it is that we came to bring that case and hopefully some of the uh, wonderful statements made by the court about PLACA in that case, John. Sure, so uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, so, I mean, as Chris said, um, you know, we at Brady have, have tried to uh, challenge PLACA for a number of years and what we decided was a case like the Gustafson case uh, was a perfect vehicle for that. And, and that case involves a tragic sort of situation and, and Griffin Dix will, will talk about that in, in more detail, but it was, uh, J.R. Gustafson was a 13 year old boy. He was uh, at a friend's house. Um, the friend was also about the same age. Um, the friend had a gun which was unloaded. It did not have a magazine, ammunition magazine in the gun. <clears throat> so he thought it was completely unloaded, pointed it at JR and pulled the trigger. Uh, there was a round in the chamber, which he did not know about, and it killed JR. And there are safety features, such as a magazine disconnect safety, which has been around for over a hundred years that would prevent a gun from firing in that sort of situation. Um, any other industry would be required to put in that sort of safety device. Gun industry is not required because they're exempt from product safety oversight uh, under an exception to the Consumer Product Safety Act, uh, but they should be subject to civil liability, a lawsuit. Yet what happened, we brought a lawsuit on behalf of Gustafson against the gun manufacturer saying they should have put in the safety feature and it was dismissed because the trial judge said, PLACA provides immunity to this uh, gun company. And we appealed it. What the appellate court said was maybe PLACA does bar this case. The Constitution does not allow Congress to prevent Pennsylvania courts from providing civil justice to the Gustafsons or people like them. A and the, the, the reason it's unconstitutional, this gets a little wonky, is uh, the Tenth Amendment, which ironically, um, I mean, Tenth Amendment basically protects states' rights, state sovereignty. Ironically, the Tenth Amendment was used by gun lobby challenges to the Brady Law and also to the Gun Free, Zone, gun -free School uh, Zones Act. Um, but in this case, what the court held correctly, we believe, is that what PLACA does is it basically says to states like uh, Pennsylvania, you can't use your courts to give civil justice to victims of gun violence. But if you want to, you can use your legislature and provide civil justice that way. And the federal government under our constitution does not have the authority to tell states what branch of government they use to make laws or to apply their civil justice system and therefore it's unconstitutional. So uh, as the court said, uh, PLACA is repugnant to the Constitution of the United States and is of no force and effect. I just wanna pivot a moment to uh, Dr. Dix, or um, if you prefer Griff, just let me know. Um, because you lost your son, Kenzo, in 1994. And I was wondering if you're comfortable, if you could tell us first, what was he like? Um, you know, 
what kind of person was he? And then if you could also share with us what happened um, to your son that year. Okay. Um, Kenzo was 15 in 1994. Um, he was a wonderful, joyful kid, freshman in high school um, on the basketball team and um, a good student, um, lots of fun. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to describe all the joy he brought to us, um, you know, every day. Um, just, um, he was right on track for, and he, we discovered um, actually some writing he had done for an English class um, after he died that said it was his 10 year plan. And he said, well, I, I like um, taking care of people. Uh, maybe I'll be a doctor, but actually I don't like treating illnesses. <laughs> so she's a little weird. Um, but, uh, and maybe animals, I like animals a lot. And uh, this and that and the other, he was, he liked writing poetry and he was just lots of fun. Um, so what happened? Um, one Sunday, he went over to a friend's house. Um, the boy was 14 years old and um, they were up in the boy's bedroom and without telling Kenzo, the boy decided he would show Kenzo his father's gun. So the boy went down to his father's bedroom to get the gun, the handgun, semi-automatic handgun that the father kept loaded and unlocked next to his bed, supposedly for protection. He picked up the Beretta 92 Compact L, took out the magazine that was loaded with bullets and picked up an empty magazine and walked back up to the bedroom where Kenzo was, walked in the door and slipped in the magazine that had that was empty and pulled the trigger expecting, he thought he'd unloaded it and expected the gun to just go click. Uh, and the bullet still hidden in the chamber killed Kenzo. Um, so in our case, a magazine disconnect safety device would not have saved Kenzo's life because he had put the empty magazine back in. But we learned later that this boy had been to the shooting range with his father and had fired that particular Beretta, learned a little bit about it, but not enough. Um, so obviously the boy had made horrible mistakes, but the, he had, if it had had a prominent chamber loaded indicator, he would have seen it on the day that he walked back up to the bedroom and he would have seen that there was something sticking up right on the top of the gun, um, telling him that there was still a bullet in the chamber. So, John Lowy argued our case, um, and ultimately there were three trials. There was jury misconduct, there was a hung jury. Ultimately we lost the case, but it, we came very close to winning. Um, and um, this was before PLACA was passed. Um, and actually in California, we passed laws setting safety standards for handguns, including a law requiring prominent chamber loaded indicators and magazine disconnect safety devices. Thanks to the Brady chapters in California, uh, wonderful volunteer leaders. Um, and the rate of unintentional gun death in California dropped by two thirds, 66%. So the laws that we're talking about save lots of lives. Uh, so, um, but we were devastated when we began, when we learned about Kenzo's death. And then we began learning about the loopholes in our gun laws that 
guns are exempt from consumer product safety, from regulation by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, first of all, and, and that this gun had been designed for the military and law enforcement, not for civilians. It didn't have the, the safety features that civilians need, but it had been sold to civilian households that have kids. And, and actually the gun industry had told people, you really need to have your gun stored where it's instantly available. And they kept playing up the need uh, to protect yourself with a gun that's immediately available, um, very irresponsible. Um, so it, it really should have, I mean, you know, lawsuits, civil lawsuits have been used for years to give incentive to uh, manufacturers of products to um, make their products safer. Um, I'll stop there and, but you know, if anything you'd like to know more. Well, I just wanted to thank you for sharing uh, your son's life with us um, and sharing your story and also for the courage that you had um, to, to work with us in light of that. Thank you. I think, Griff, one of the reasons why your words are so powerful is that I think when a lot of people hear something like placa, it sounds like a wonky word, right? Or they hear a legal case or they hear that Brady was involved in a legal case and it was in a state court or a especially for someone who's not familiar with the law it seems like I you know like a lot of highfalutin nonsense to, to be honest that it's stuff that people are voting on that it's stuff it's a court case that went on as you said court cases take a long time there were three versions of them it this placa case seems like it it might be this really difficult thing for people to grasp but at the end of the day these cases exist because people have to go home without their loved ones Mm -hmm. these these cases exist because a gun manufacturer didn't do their job correctly or or didn't follow safety standards that if say they were selling dog food they would have to follow and and as a result people aren't safe people aren't able to come home you lost your son so i i really want to thank you for being here and for being present because i think it really demonstrates that the names in these stories aren't just names or statistics they're people yeah. So thank you so and thank you so much for sharing Kenzo. As no, just over the years, I've seen so many cases that that John Loy has brought and the Brady legal team has brought of cases like mine. It's just and they're they're amazing to see over and over again these similar cases brought up um, and where there's this need to make you know, especially semi-automatic handguns safer, especially for gun owners um, and for anyone else. Um, yeah. Well, on, on that note, John, as someone who, as, as Griffith said, represented the Dixes, but has represented other families in very similar situations because Brady has represented other families in very similar situations. I'm wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about what that's like specifically with these placa devoted cases, because I assume that it must be incredibly, in some ways rewarding, understandably, because you get to, you work with really great people, but at the same time, so frustrating. So first of all, I should say that just recently I uh, celebrated my 23rd anniversary with Brady and I was hired 23 years ago to represent uh, Griff and his uh, ex-wife, uh, Lynn Kenzo's parents. That was my first case. Um, and, you know, it's frustrating, sure, but it's, it's mostly uh, just extremely uh, inspiring and satisfying to represent people like, like Griff. Uh, I mean, I'll use, I mean, Griff as an example. Um, the only reason he wanted to bring a lawsuit was because he didn't want other families to suffer the way his did. That's the only reason. Uh, he said at many times, 
that even if he could, if Beretta was going to award or give uh, millions of dollars, he would exchange that for them to change the way they make guns and take nothing if they just made their guns safer. So it, it's just uh, extremely uh, gratifying and inspiring uh, to represent Griff and, and other people like him, like the Gustafsons. And I will say that, you know, these cases, uh, when they go forward, when they're not blocked by a law like PLACA, they can make a huge difference. I mean, Griff mentioned that that this case, even though we lost ultimately in the court, it changed California law. It also changed the way some guns are made. I and mean, what happened in that case is one of the, the theories was, in addition to the uh, chamber loaded indicator that, that Griff talked about, was we argued that this gun could have been made with a built-in lock, which would, uh, so you'd have to uh, sort of open the, the or unlock the gun with a key or, or a combination in order to fire it. And if the gun had been made with that, um, this boy would not have been able to fire it. And during the trial, we had an expert show the gun that he made and is basically, and it's just his office with the internal lock and Beretta, which is a very highfalutin gun company, sort of made fun of us and poked holes in it. Well, after the suit, Beretta began putting out some guns with internal locks and a bunch of other manufacturers began doing the same thing. And the only reason was they knew even though they, they won in this court case, they might not win the next one or the one after that. And it made sense financially for them to start you know, cleaning up their act. They haven't done it nearly enough. And because of PLACA, they've sort of backtracked, I think. Um, but that shows you know, the sort of public good that uh, this sort of case uh, can do. Right. And kind of underlying all the things that we talked about here, as you mentioned, John, that PLACA was on the gun lobby's wish list. And you know, in the face of the lawsuit, on one hand, they were acting skeptical, but then they got their act together. So I really want to turn to Aryan here because you and Team Enough more broadly have really been working to undermine the gun lobby for a while now. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it's like um, to be fighting against the gun lobby. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think it's first important to emphasize that many of us aren't in this fight because of the gun lobby. Most of us are in this fight because we have either been personally affected by gun violence or our communities have been targeted by gun violence um, because gun violence does disproportionately affect marginalized communities. And I think there is sometimes this impression that people get that the NRA is our enemy and that's not what my philosophy is and that's not what our philosophy is within Team Enough. We believe that systemic racism is our enemy. We believe that at the end of the day, gun violence comes from this institutionalized racism. And so our advocacy isn't just about combating the gun lobby, it's about removing those underlying root causes towards gun violence which really exasper, really just worsen this crisis and, and, and ensure that gun violence is an attack against minority communities across this country. Uh, with that said, we do recognize that the gun lobby is complicit in those systemic injustices and that they back many of these horrific policies which lead to the deaths of black and brown people across this country. Um, when, when we look at the gun lobby's work towards militarizing the police, for example, they have vigorously pursued uh, militarizing um, a police force which really should protect us into something that isn't protecting us. And they, they've really balsized their weapons and ensured that they are killing many of us. Um, and so our advocacy is really about understanding how the gun lobby can uphold those systems of racism which unfortunately dominate the gun violence conversation in America. And it's really about finding ways that we can dismantle those systems. And I think that PLACA and more specifically, repealing and ruling that PLACA is unconstitutional is a critical step towards that. Because at the end of the day, we cannot keep the gun industry accountable for their dangerous and frankly racist policies if we cannot pursue civil litigation against them. And so uh, I know that was really a roundabout way of answering the question. We really are focused on that intersection of gun violence with hate. And keeping, gun, keeping the gun lobby accountable for that is incredibly important to actually combating that intersection. I mean, I think that that's so important to point out. I think that, one, I agree with everything that you said. And one of the things that I think is so great is 
pointing out, I think, to individuals that things are complicated, things are intersectional. There is not an easy two second quick Twitter <laughs> answer to anything, I think is really important, especially to remember in, in the world's political climate that it is now, that these having these conversations like this even on this panel are really important to breaking down. Cause I don't think I can tweet in 140 characters or less what PLACA is and why it's important, let alone why rules that particular lobbies want are allowed to happen <laughs> in the US over the will of the American people. And with that, I'm wondering if, if we could talk a little bit um, to stay with you about this thread that I'm getting here too of people getting involved in activism. So for example, Griff, you, you've been in gun violence prevention since your son was taken. And I was just wondering what it's been like for you to see a decision like this now after years of fighting um, to help protect other young people and then also um, for you, Arian, what it's like, I mean, because you're not much older than Kenzo was. I mean, I hate to put you on the spot as the youth voice, but as our Team Enough member, I'm gonna do that to you. So maybe uh, we can start with you, Griff. Okay. Um, it seems to me it's a very important step forward to realize that Black is unconstitutional. Um, it, I mean, there, there are many types of arguments you can make that it's unconstitutional in many ways. And I'll, I, you know, I'm not qualified to go into all of them, but one of the ways is it just singles out people who are victims of unsafe firearms or, and says, no, you don't get equal rights <laughs> um, under the law. <laughs> Um, everybody else is supposed to, but you don't. Um, yeah, that's that's one problem. And so the federal government is stepping in and saying, wait, you states can't, you know, allow state laws um, or, or you can't, you know, you can't bring lawsuits. Um, you know, civil lawsuits. Um, so it's a very important, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, I, I really want to echo that, that it is so important um, to see that clock is trying to the course and to see that we can actually keep the gun lobby accountable. Um, and to me, I'm I'm really still shook over it, to be honest, because I remember a year ago, we teaming up with lobbying for the repeal clock. Um, and, and in Congress, we were literally told by Republican staffers that this is common sense, that we should be repealing clock. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't going to happen because of the political reality around FACA and around the gun debate in America. And so it, it is so heartening to see that we are making progress. But at the same time, I, I think it is really important to acknowledge that this is just one step of many that we have to take to ending the gun violence epidemic in America. Because at the end of the day, PLACA isn't the cause of gun violence in America, systemic racism is. And until we actually go in and change our approach to justice in this country, we aren't gonna end gun violence. And I, I, it's really heartening to me to see that we've made, we, we've come one step closer there, but the, the fight certainly isn't finished and we have a lot more to do specifically for its racial justice. Yeah, unfortunately, that's why this was the name of this pod of this particular podcast was just a victory, <laughs> not all of the victories, but I have faith. I have faith we can get there. I want to turn to uh, Griff and Chris for a moment because we've talked a lot about the implications of PLACA, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why the gun industry isn't pushed like other industries to improve their products. I mean, if a car comes out and it's faulty and people sue, they're, all, they're always competing to be safer, right? And it sounds like uh, when it comes to guns, there's just stagnation. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, why gun manufacturers are able to just continue to make unsafe products. Um, it, it's, it's a mystery, <laughs> really. Um, you know, I mean, there was another part of our own lawsuit, which had to do with a manual that came with this Beretta. Um, 
And it would have been extremely easy for Beretta to indicate, you know, much more clearly the dangers of unsafe storage and to indicate that this gun had a little tiny um, thing they call the chamber loaded indicator that it was really designed for police to feel in the dark. <laughs> it, it didn't work. It's the, the extractor is the little thing that pulls out um, a empty cartridge casing after the bullet has been fired. And, you know, it, it didn't work as even for highly trained police to feel that there was still a bullet in the chamber when it, this thing stuck out just slightly more. Um, we don't need to go into that, but um, even that was not clearly mentioned in this manual. And you could put a tag on the, the you know, trigger of the gun saying, this is dangerous, you know, store it safely, this and that and the other, lots of things they could do. And that when gun makers started building the kind of chamber loaded indicator that we had had a person designed to show in as a prototype in our trials and the gun industry had experts that said, oh no, that'll blow up. Um, they, they worked just fine. And um, then um, they, they had a little engraving on it that said, loaded went up and a little red flag sh showed whenever there was a bullet in the chamber uh, and saved lots of lives. It's so simple. I mean, it's not a difficult design. So why didn't they do that more earlier? Um, it's very mysterious. Yeah, if I could jump in, Griff, there was something that I think shows why they don't make their products safer. And it was actually came out in, in the trial of, of your case um, where Beretta did not put certain safety features like magazine disconnect safety into their guns. And then they once got a contract from the Canadian Mounted Police. Right. And the Canadian Mounties said, we want this safety device in our guns. And the, I forgot how much the contract was, a million dollars more. They put in the safety device. And, and if when they knew that children were dying because they didn't put the safety device in, that didn't move them an inch. It still was cheaper to sell the gun without safety feature. But when they made money from the Canadian Mounties to put the safety feature in, on a dime, they put it in. So it was just all about money. And that's the danger of PLACA because PLACA insulates them from accountability. And the whole one of the major points of civil litigation is that it puts a price on socially dangerous conduct and mm -hmm. it's so when you engage in conduct like don't put in safety features and the griffin dixes and the kenzo dixes and the jr gustafsons of the world pay for that decision if you make the, the company begin to pay for that decision and pay money to the dixes or the gustafsons then they'll change their behavior and that's why civil litigation is so important and that's why plaque a shielding from accountability the gun industry enables them to to get away with this extremely destructive conduct and i think what john and and griff are both saying is so important if i could just amplify a few of these points um, i think it's important for everyone to understand what john is describing in terms of at least the gun dealer or the gun manufacturer conduct here and the Royal Canadian Police and being able to put these kinds of safety features in. Any manufacturer of any product in the United States acting today has to make these same kinds of choices. What John is describing in terms of the litigation landscape is often the reason they do, right? When you're in law school, you study case after case after case of tort actions, right? These are civil liability suits that are brought on behalf of consumers against major companies in order to seek remedy for some kind of harm that has happened, 
That is the essence of our entire litigation system. And what Congress said at the behest of the NRA years ago with PLACA is, we're going to accept the gun industry from basically all civil litigation. What John and his team have done since then is poke major holes in that immunity, but it still exists. And what it stops is the kind of innovation that John and Griff are talking about. That's why most of the companies have not done that. Even though we already know outside of the United States, there are guns for sale. There are actually even smart guns. Those are guns that have certain trigger identification mechanisms where only the rightful owner of that gun is able to shoot the gun. And if you look at the history of smart gun technology and the consumer market for smart guns, there's a huge potential consumer market. What's not happening is the sale of smart guns in the United States, because in the few examples where that has happened, the gun manufacturers have successfully shut that down. And it's because they don't want to invest more in these kinds of features. They would rather sell more product with less investment. And that's why the gun industry has put almost zero, zero dollars into research and development, R&D. For most companies out there operating in the United States of America, their R&D budget is big. Why is that? Because they need to innovate. They understand that's the essence of survival. What Congress has done with PLACA is create a disincentive for the gun industry on that side of the equation. And at the same time, they have precluded other kinds of basic regulation of this industry, for example, through the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So on both sides of the coin, the National Rifle Association has historically successfully blocked the ability of consumers to change this industry to protect the public safety. That is un-American and that is what we think should be changed. Uh, and I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Griff. I just well, wanted to um, thank just, Chris for, oh. <laughs> we're still doing it. Sorry, I've been in a seclusion too long. Please go ahead, Griff. Just one thing we haven't mentioned is sort of the scope of the problem, uh, several problems here. Um, one is that there are between 450 and 500 unintentional gun deaths every year um, now. And since the CDC began counting them, there have been more unintentional gun deaths than Americans died in wars. Um, so those deaths mount up, but many of the, when, when someone dies, or when someone is shot, um, you know, unintentionally, often the gun is not aimed. Many of those people don't die. They are, they're non-fatally injured, huge numbers of those people and they suffer enormously. Their medical bills are enormous and we should not forget them. Um, so. I think that's a really important point, Griff, and I'm so glad that you raised that. You know, eight kids are unintentionally killed or injured every single day um, by family fire. That's the uh, improper storage of gun in the, right. of a gun in the home. And of those eight, seven of them are injured but live with the consequences of those injuries for the rest of their lives. I think that's a really important point as we consider the overall costs, not just to families, to individuals, to families, but our society of treating individuals who have lifelong, sometimes grievous injuries that impact them for the rest of their lives as a result of those injuries. And I just have to put in a plug for one thing because we did a report on this at Brady several years ago, the shooting costs report. Without the Affordable Care Act and the additional coverage that provides, nearly two thirds of all individuals today who are victims of gun violence receive their medical care as a result of the Affordable Care Act. 
So any efforts to undermine that or remove the protections of the ACA mean not that those individuals won't be treated in an emergency setting, because they will, it's just taxpayers will pay for that because ultimately we do. But those people who are shot and injured through no fault of their own will have no additional coverage for the kinds of treatment that allow them to live some semblance of a normal life. That is not a benefit to them. It's not an individual benefit to their communities and it's certainly not a societal benefit. We need to internalize that when we're thinking about both the impact on individuals of these kinds of shootings, their families, and the availability of affordable and meaningful health insurance to cover those victims. I think very well said, Chris, thank you. And as we start to run out of time, because I only get to have an hour with you wonderful people, um, I wanted to make sure that we took some listener questions as well. So we do have questions coming in. Uh, if you have questions, please hurry up and get them in. We cannot run over <laughs> in time. Um, even during a pandemic, people still have to go to dinner. So um, I want to start with the first question, which actually is for, for you, Ariane, uh, for Team Enough. Did you say that Team Enough had lobbied against PLACA? Could you tell us what that means? Yeah, so our youth lobbying collectives are absolutely wonderful programs, which exist in four uh, places, DC, Virginia, Florida, and California. We've all taken legislative action um, through our state legislatures, as well as the federal uh, Congress, to demand that our elected officials actually do reform our systems. And so through, I, I was a member of the DC Lobbying Collective last year, and one of the bills that we lobbied for was the repeal of PLACA at the federal level. And we, we went to our elected officials and we told them we had conversations with their staffers around PLACA, along with a host of other intersectional measures um, around life-saving gun violence prevention measures. Um, and I think that that's just a testament of our power as youth, because the reality is, is that our elected officials don't hear from us enough, We, especially from our generation. Um, they don't hear from us enough at the ballot. They don't hear enough. They don't hear from us enough in their offices. And so it is so important that we as youth actually take the steps to go and hold them accountable. And lobbying is one of the best ways to do that. And I, I mean, I, I think that we have this perception of lobbying that it's super inaccessible and that it's super hard. But in, in reality, the gun violence prevention movement is incredibly common sense. Most of the solutions that we advocate for are supported by the vast majority of Americans. And I truly do believe that anyone can lobby, anyone has the power to lobby. It's just about uh, and taking the necessary time to research yourself and assembling a diverse coalition uh, of individuals from every single generation, from every single community to go out there and advocate for those life-saving gun violence prevention measures. And can anyone sign up to lobby with Team Enough if they're of age? Where would they find that? That wasn't a question, that's me just plugging. <laughs> Where can they find that information? Yeah, so check out our website. I think it's teamenough.org. Um, our lobbying collective applications have closed for the four, um, for the four collectives at this current time, but they will reopen um, in, in the next couple of months. So make sure that you sign up for our mailing list and stuff like that. And individual chapters, of course, do take local um, lobbying actions all the time. Uh, I know that we've done that before around some reading setting projects. And so make sure you sign up for our mailers and our text lists, and we will be sure to forward you those opportunities when they do come. Thank you so much. I have another question here that is for Chris and Loey. Um, it is essentially, does, will PLACA or, or does PLACA have anything to do with the way in which gun manufacturers market their weapons? I think presumably, so I think that it was mentioned, um, I think by you Griff too, in this case, that they had marketed it, it that this particular seller had marketed as this as something that you needed in your home or if it was something you needed in your home, something that against all of our end family fire advice that you keep uh, loaded and stored. So I think this is the so, question, would PLACA do anything with that or is that a separate battle we have to fight? Um, well, it is related because one cause of action that you can have against a gun company is that their marketing was unreasonable, illegal, uh, you know, dangerous, deceptive. There are various legal boxes you can put it in. Um, and those cases are restricted by PLACA. Now you can get around PLACA in many of our cases, I should say we do get around PLACA in various exceptions. 
uh, the Sandy Hook families had a marketing claim against the assault weapon manufacturer and co the court held there that they could bring the case, but it still was restricted because of PLACA. What, they couldn't bring all the cause of action that they needed to, and there are other courts that have not allowed those sorts of claims to go forward. So uh, yeah, it is important. And to tie into to what Ariane was saying um, about the systemic racism, you know, marketing is a part of this story. It was a part of Kenzo's story because the gun lobby, you know, markets handguns to people saying, you know, be afraid. Be, and often it's very coded who you should be afraid of. And, and that's why you need a gun in your home and you need it at the ready and you need to store it loaded. Even if they say that the, the gun should not be loaded, it's sort of with a wink knowing that people like uh, you know, the man who owned the gun in uh, Griff's case uh, would store it loaded because he wanted it at the ready because he was afraid somebody was going to come in and attack his family. And that's gun industry marketing. And so you need to address that partly in, you know, in litigation. And I, I do think, just to add to John's point, it's always helpful to draw analogies to these things, right? So what John is saying is, yes, PLACA purportedly is trying to limit the ability to bring a case on behalf of victims of gun violence, people who've lost family members because of the way a gun has you know, not been effectively designed uh, to protect the safety of individuals. Imagine if you couldn't bring a case against a car manufacturer based on how they also market cars, right? One of the things that has come forward in some of the litigation is the way that uh, some manufacturers have marketed their products with respect to guns is get your man card here. Uh, you will find these kinds of advertisements. Imagine if that's the way that automobile manufacturers were moving forward with marketing their products and there was a particular kind of consumer attracted to a particular car as a result of that and they drove really fast and there were all kinds of issues and public health hazards because of it, but we were prevented from bringing any cases. Well, it's really hard to change behavior when you have that kind of limitation on liability. That's really at the end what we're talking about here. So yes, advertising and marketing is a component of what purportedly PLACA is trying to preclude bringing causes of action for. Yeah, I was going to say one of the other questions we got, um, which I think you've, you've all answered and articulated so well, was just, so I can sue a manufacturer if their shampoo makes my hair fall out, but not if, you know, the gun explodes in my hand. And, it, it, and it, it, they, they followed with the tagline, Loey, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> I mean, literally a gun dealer, if he sold a tuna fish sandwich to his customer, and it was spoiled and it caused food poisoning. There's no question that gun dealer could be sued. There are many cases I could tell you about where a gun dealer would negligently sell or supply a gun to someone, to a gun trafficker or to someone else who's dangerous. In some of those cases, they would have immunity, exact same person. And it happened because the gun industry had enough clout in the US Senate to get it uh, past. I do not think they have that clout today. Um, uh, and, and so I'm very hopeful about, you know, Team Enough and, and Brady and others lobbying to, uh, to repeal PLACA if it's not completely struck down in the courts. Um, but that's, it, it certainly did have that clout um, in 2005. But, um, you know, a, a gun dealer sold uh, assault weapons advertising that they were fingerprint resistant to uh, the, the uh, guy who um, murdered m many people in the 101 California Street shooting of a, a law firm that he thought he had been, you know, done wrong by, uh, which led to the, uh, what's now the Giffords Law Center. Um, the, um, <laughs> so. 
It's just going to chime in on that last question too about being able to sue the shampoo manufacturer, not the gun manufacturer. And one thing that's kind of been implicit um, in this conversation that I just want to make explicit is that there are exceptions to PLACA. So it's not that it um, would prevent you from bringing any case ever. And that's why we have the record of cases that we have. It's just that it makes it so much harder and puts a barrier in your way. And as we all sort of talked about, litigation can be very expensive. It can be very emotional. Um, it can be very taxing. And so what PLACA has been able to do is disincentivize um, attorneys and clients from wanting to take that risk um, and bring those cases. And that has an overall effect because there are industries like the automobile industry, the tobacco industry, that, where there's people all over um, because the road's a little bit smoother. And John has been really good about knocking down those barriers all over, but they still exist. And so it still is it is a barrier, but it's not a complete, um, it's not a complete bar. And that's why uh, Johnson working so hard to, to find those places and attack it. And in the time that we have, I wanna ask um, a question to everybody on the panel, which is where do we go from here? So obviously the case um, that we're talking about said that Placa was unconstitutional, but there's a possibility that it'll be appealed. So what do we do to continue to push towards getting Placa ultimately repealed? Um, and what can listeners who are really concerned about all of the things that we talked about today do to get involved? I'll chime in first and then um, uh, everyone else can, can uh, chime in as well. So obviously please support Brady um, uh, John and his legal team have been fighting in the courts for 30 years. Um, and one of our chief objectives is to have uh, PLACA overturned. Uh, obviously the case we're talking about is a significant victory in that journey, but we could not do that without support of folks like you. So please go to our website, um, amplify the importance of this, support our work. Uh, and also understand that, you know, the courts are a really important component for us. I think Kelly really well said, we've poked a lot of holes in PLACA. So we're continuing to do that. We also want it ruled unconstitutional. That's one front. The other is legislative. And that's why this election is really important. Who sits on our Supreme Court is very important. We're very concerned about the process that's taking place right now. We don't think uh, that it's a fair process and ultimately, regardless of who's put on, but certainly if it is o Amy Coney Barrett, based on uh, what we see of her, we're very concerned about how a court ultimately might rule on many cases. Um, and so we wanna be very, very clear with you that there is a path forward both uh, in the courts and we're advancing that, but also legislatively, um, through the work of Team Enough and Brady to overturn PLACA is a major priority in the next Congress. And so you can find out more information about what we're doing on all of these things at our website, bradyunited.org. Uh, you know, I would second that completely. John Loy has put together a whole network of uh, lawyers who work pro bono for victims of gun violence when they can find a lawsuit that they can bring despite PLACA. And it's very helpful uh, to push the boundaries. And then, you know, this lawsuit is an example of pushing the boundaries and being successful. This, um, and Adam, Representative Adam Schiff has a law, a bill, to, a federal bill to overturn PLACA at the federal level. So, yeah, and we should all support him. And I, I'd add to that, um, for one, reach out to us at, at Brady if you think there's a potential lawsuit against the gun industry and, and we will you know, give free advice and consider taking the case or finding a lawyer who, who would, if you, whether it's an unintentional shooting or a criminal shooting where you wonder how did this a shooter get his hands on a gun? Often it's because someone in the gun industry did something wrong and there may be a lawsuit there. And then 
uh, you know, get involved. Like, you know, Griff uh, has for decades, um, but you don't have to be personally affected. I mean, somebody great said, and I'm forgetting who it was that, that you know, you, we can't have, uh, we won't, can't have uh, true change until those who are not affected uh, care as much as those who are affected. And I think that's true for all of us. So everyone should just step up and a good way to start is to uh, connect with Brady, connect with Team Enough and, um, and get to work. And as always, all of those resources will be linked to in the descriptor of the of the podcast and of this live. We always do that. But I do that I, if I can highlight really quickly, since can, if we can all maybe like just give like little snaps for 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 Loie and Kelly and the rest of the legal team, because I am the amount of work that legal does and puts forth the number of people that they represent. And I'm still it, it's floors me. And I'm still shocked that more people don't realize the immense amount of pro bono work that uh, Brady Legal does for survivors of gun violence. So I wanna I wanna recognize that, and I also want to thank you again, Griff, for coming on and, and telling us about your son, particularly on your birthday. <laughs> can you. I can I say briefly a story which tells you who Griff Dix is? The day if, if, after he's, the day the after the hour, if he's comfortable. The day after Kenzo was killed, the first thing that Griff did with Lynn was to go to the house of the boy who shot and killed Ketza to ask him how was he doing? Was he okay? That tells you all you need to know about Griff. That poor boy, um, you can't imagine what he went through. Yeah. He made a horrible mistake, but it was the design of the gun as well as his mistake. You know, 14 year old boys make mistakes sometimes. It's up to adults to see that they don't end in someone's death. And so we all have to step up, as you say. Well, Griff, thank you for everything that you've done, not only in uh, working with John to try to bring about reform, but in all of the work that you've done and Brady uh, leading the charge in California, you and several others who unfortunately like you are joined having lost children and loved ones to gun violence. It's still just an incredible inspiration that you have dedicated your lives to ensure that that never happens to anyone else. And I think John's remarks about you are just so moving, there are almost no words for it, but we owe you a huge debt of gratitude. And thank you so much for your work to save lives. You've made a real, real difference. Thank you. And now we're joined by many young people <laughs> who are doing great work. Yes, so. true inspiration. The torch has been passed. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you all for coming on. I wanna thank our audience for being here with us. And if you're listening to this after it was live and you have any additional questions for our fantastic panel, Kelly, John, Chris, Griffin, Arian, let me know. And I, I will forward those questions along. Um, but again, thank you all so much for being here. Thanks, thank you. See you soon, Griff. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.